Perhaps the central concept in mathematics is that of equality. But the notion of equality, of two things being the same, or two things being equivalent in some sense, this occurs throughout mathematics and it actually is used in a bunch of different ways with a bunch of different symbols. We'll start with level one, which is sort of the notion of equality that you'd expect to see in school. But even there, there's a lot of different ways that the same equal sign gets used. Like, for example, I'll call numerical equality be probably what the first thing that comes to your mind is. Something like 1 plus 2 is equal to 3, or maybe a little bit more controversially, 0 0.9999 repeating is equal to 1. Both of these statements were saying that the thing represented on the left and the right side of this equality represent the same number. That is, that 1 plus 2 is the same quantity as the number 3. But this is not the only option. I'll refer to conditional equality to be an equation like this one. I've got an equal sign here, but this is not saying the thing on the left and the thing on the right are always equal. It's only sometimes true that this is the case. This is really asking a question. For what values of x is it that this expression is true? And it turns out for x equal to 1 and x equal to 2 and only those two options, then this represents the same number on both sides. In contrast, I'll use the same equal sign for identities. Like if I take the same x minus 1 times x minus 2, if I expand that out, I get that x squared minus 3x plus 2. This is an identity. It is always true. It doesn't depend on the value of x. So the equal sign, again, is being used for a bunch of different things. I also use equal signs for definitions. Like, for example, this is the definition of the derivative. You learn it in my calculus courses. And the details don't matter. But the point is that the thing on the right-hand side, calculus students can hopefully understand, and the thing on the left-hand side, the derivative, this is a definition of what I mean by the derivative. Sometimes you'll see a slightly different symbol used here. You use colon equal sign when you want to say that the thing on the left is defined to be the thing on the right. But nevertheless, we're using the equal sign to have a bunch of different meanings. One more, sometimes you get a notion of assignments. Like, for example, I might say, let x equal to 3, or suppose x equal to 3, or when x is equal to 3, go and do a computation. Compute the function at the value of 3, or the derivative of the value of 3. You're not saying that x equal to 3 is something that's true forever. You're saying, for right now, let's play around in the scenario. Let's assign the value of x equal to 3. So the point is that this one symbol is capturing a bunch of different usages all at the same time. But that's only level 1. For level two, I want to talk about something called equivalence relations. Let me start with this equation, uh, 6 plus 7 equals 1, which you probably are looking at and thinking that's ridiculous, until I put up a picture of a clock. And as soon as I do that, if it's 6 o'clock and you add 7 hours, you would get to 1 o'clock, and so you'd probably agree. So what's going on here? Well, this represents something called modular arithmetic. I'll give you an example. Suppose I've got all the uh, natural numbers here, we could do the integers as well. And I'm going to color code them in threes. 1 and 4 and 7 and 10 are all colored the same, 2 and 5 and 8 and 11 are all colored the same, and so on. So what I'm going to try to do is group all these numbers by this gap of 3, and this is called modular arithmetic. We typically use a sign that's kind of like the equal sign, but with three lines here for modular arithmetic. Sometimes it's used for the expression called identically equal to as well, but in this context it's modular arithmetic. And basically what it means is two numbers are considered equivalent or equal uh, under modular arithmetic if the difference between them is a multiple of three. So, for example, if I look at one and four, one and four are equivalent in modular arithmetic with mod three because their difference is just three times one. And so while one and four visually look different, what we're basically saying is that we're gluing the 1 and 4 together as being the same thing in this particular structure. In the same way that on a clock, 13 o'clock and 1 o'clock, even though those different numbers, we're going to glue them together and think of them as the same idea. You get something similar in geometry, like this is a triangle, and what I can do is I can do rotations and translations and actually even reflections of that triangle and I get different results. But I haven't changed the angles, I haven't changed the sides. In geometry, these are the triangles A and B, we're going to say that these triangles are congruent and we use an equal sign with a kind of little tilde on top of it, this is called congruence. 
these triangles are the same. I mean, they're not the same set of points. They've been translated, rotated, and reflected, but we're saying that from the purposes of geometry and the kinds of things that we care about in geometry, these are equivalents. Now, both modular arithmetic and congruence in geometry are both examples of a larger concept called equivalence relations. A relation is anything that takes two objects and asks, are they related or are they not? The first property is called reflexive, and it just means that you need to be equivalent to yourself. So for equality, one is always equal to one, or a triangle that doesn't move is conjugate to itself. The second property is called symmetry, and it says if x relates to y, then y relates back to x. So if 1 plus 2 equals 3, then 3 is equal to 1 plus 2 as well. If a triangle A is equivalent to a triangle B, then B is equivalent to the triangle A as well. And then the third property is called transitivity. It's the most interesting of the one. And it says if x is equivalent to y and y is equivalent to z, then x is equivalent to z. Like if triangle A is congruent to triangle B and triangle B is congruent to triangle C, then triangle A is congruent to triangle C. And so equivalence relations sort of generalizes the basic idea of equality, just of numbers that we've seen, into a bunch of different concepts and, and allows us to say two different things are going to be equivalent and we mean by that having these three properties. Level three is called bijections. And to introduce this, I want to contrast a few different sets. So I want you to contrast the set one, two, three, uh, or the set B, which is also one, two, three, but then I painted a different color, or maybe I spoke it in a different language, or I represented in some way that was a little bit different. Probably you think that's the same. What about if instead of one, two, three, I just put placeholders, alpha, beta, gamma? Or what if I put different numbers like two, four, and six? So which of these should I think of as the same? Which should I think of them as different? For example, if I look at A and D as subsets of the integers, I mean, they're different subsets, they're not the same, but there is a function that goes between them, which is multiplication by two. One goes to two, two goes to four, and three goes to six. And this function sort of tells me how I can get from one to the other, but it has some really nice properties. More generally for function a and b, I maybe say one to alpha and two to gamma and three to beta. I can do any function I wish. To be what's called a bijection, you need your function between your two sets to have two properties. First of all, it needs to be what's called onto. Onto means it hits everything in b. The alpha and the beta and the gamma are the image of something. Everything is being hit. And then secondly, it's what's called one-to-one, -one, which means it hits each thing only once. In this one, nothing hits alpha, so it's not onto. And it's actually not one-to-one -one either because both one and three go to beta. It fails both of those properties. And in general, if you have a function that's bijective, this is our notion in mathematics of it, the set having the same basic size. And we extend this to all sorts of funny infinite sets. For example, if you consider all of the natural numbers and then also all of the even natural numbers like two, four, six, eight, ten, 10, and so on. I mean, are those the same size? According to mathematicians, yes, they are because there's this function 2x that goes between them. It's this bijective function. It's gonna hit all of those even natural numbers and it's gonna hit them exactly once. So we can line up the natural numbers and twice the natural numbers, and in succession, we say that they have the same size. This leads to all sorts of uh, fun stuff. I've done some previous videos on it. You can ask questions about sizes of infinite sets. But this is the notion of bijection. And what we're really interested in is size, that bijection is sort of the notion of equality that applies here. But actually, bijection is just a special case of the level four notion of equivalence, which is gonna be called isomorphisms. And the idea here is that if I have a set, this is for example the integers, the integers aren't just a set of numbers that sits there and doesn't do anything. The integers have what we call additional structure. I can add things in the integers, one plus two equals three. I can multiply things in the integers, two times three is equal to six. It's a set, but it also has this additional structure of addition and multiplication. And those additions and multiplications obey rules. A few rules that this satisfies is there's an associativity, like one plus two together plus three is one plus two plus three put together in brackets, that's associativity. Uh, there's this very special number zero in the integers where if you add zero to anything, you just get back to whatever, like two plus zero is equal to two. And it's this really cool property that if you start with any number A, like two say, 
you can always add negative two and get to that so-called additive identity zero. These three properties of this addition structure on the integers make addition something known in mathematics as a group. But there's also multiplication, except multiplication doesn't work quite as nicely. Okay, you have associativity, that's still true. Uh, you have an identity, it's now the identity one, like anything times one is equal to itself. But it doesn't have that third property about inverses. If I take the number two, to get to one, I'd have to do two times a half. A half isn't an integer. So the integers do not have this third property. That is, the rules for addition and the rules for multiplication are a bit different. The fancy name for this structure uh, that has this addition and this multiplication with the rules as described here is called a ring. It doesn't really matter. But the point is, you have to be careful about your structure. If I went to the real numbers, however, how about like positive real numbers, like from zero to infinity, not including zero, actually it then does include this because two times a half would be there. Additive structure would fail to have inverses now, but the multiplicative one does. So what we have is two different sets, the real numbers and then the positive real numbers. The real numbers has an additive structure that forms a group, and the positive real numbers with multiplication also forms a group, obeys those same list of rules. But they look visually very different. I mean, they're, they're different sets. One's half the, the number of elements as the other, and, and then of course, a very different thing, addition versus multiplication, but, but, there is this function e to the x and its inverse called logarithm. And these functions somehow translate back and forth between them. I mean, the first thing to note is that this is the function e to the x, so what does it do? Its inputs are all real numbers, its outputs are the positive real, so e to the x goes from the one set to the other. But it doesn't just go there, you can check that e to the x actually is a bijection. It's onto, so it hits everything in the positive reals, and it hits everything in the positive reals only once. It's a bijection. So that would be our level three notion of equivalence, that there's this bijection between them. But it's more than that. It's a bijection that respects the structure, the, the addition and the multiplication that we have on each of these two different sets. In particular, remember the log, in particular, remember the exponential rule that e to the sum, like e to the a plus b, is the product of the exponentials, e to the a times e to the b. So somehow this exponential is turning the additive structure on R into the multiplicative structure on the positive reals. Like, for example, if I write an equation one plus two equal to three, okay, that, that could work in the first group. If I take exponential of both sides, okay, you get e to the three on one side, e to the one plus two on the other, but e to the one plus two via our rule is the same thing as e to the one times e to the two. So what do we have on the bottom row? It's sort of like the equivalent equation after I've applied this function to the original, like one plus two equals three, or e to the one times e to the two equals e to the three, they represent the same relationship between these numbers, and I could do either side of this to do my calculation, and then take the function f or f inverse to get back to the other side. In fact, I could solve any algebraic expression using only you know, addition and subtraction in the first group, and only using multiplication and division in the second group, but the point is they're equivalent and this function e to the x ties them together. This is called an isomorphism. In general, our definition is if you have a function that goes between a set with a notion of addition and another set with a notion of, I'll use multiplication just to have a different symbol, it's called a group isomorphism if, well, first of all, you have to have a bijection, you have to have the same sort of size, but also it has to play nicely with the notions of addition and multiplication, that f of the sum of two things, well, you take the, the f of the a and the f of the b individually, and then you just multiply them. The second property is called having a homomorphism, and when you have a bijection with a homomorphism, you get something called an isomorphism. The symbol we're using here is actually the same one we saw before for congruence of triangles, but what we have here is something that we're calling an isomorphism in this context. And as you go on in math, you might add all sorts of different types of structure. So for example, for myself, I'm a topologist. I'm really interested in functions that are continuous. And I might say that a coffee cup and a donut is thought of as equivalent. I mean, they're both these sort of uh, solid objects in three dimensions that have this single whole. And the technical way is a notion very much like an isomorphism here. We call it a homeomorphism. And it demands that we have this continuous function with a continuous inverse. I've added extra structure by demanding continuity here, 
but it's a similar idea to orthomorphism that we have written down right here. Now, I've only been scratching the surface about equivalence relations and isomorphisms. There's so many more that I could show you. And there's even higher level notions. There's a whole concept of something called category theory. I, I plan to do a video about that at some point. But this is just scratching the surface that equality can mean so many things in different contexts throughout mathematics to still capture the idea of equivalence depending on what it is that you actually are interested in and are actually caring about. Now, if you want to actually get better at mathematics, then my strong recommendation is the sponsor of today's video, which is Brilliant.org. Brilliant uses highly visual and interactive problem solving to make you better at math. My core belief as a professor is that math is for everyone. Everyone can learn math, can enjoy math, and can use math in their lives. But learning is best in a supportive environment. And for a couple years now, I've been recommending Brilliant to my audience because I think it does an incredibly good job of supporting you in your learning journeys. Learning with Brilliant is very personalized. You can choose from their thousands of lessons, anything from foundational math all the way up to calculus and beyond. And because it's so interactive with you always in the driver's seat, playing with the animations, testing your knowledge, you get to be the star of your own learning. Whatever your learning goals are, if you do just a little bit every day on Brilliant, this can compound to real changes in your ability to problem solve with math over time. To try everything that Brilliant has for free, go to brilliant.org slash Trevor Bazzett or click the link down in the description. And clicking that link will give you 20% off their annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited daily access to everything that Brilliant has to offer. With that said and done, I hope you enjoyed this video. Leave any questions down in the description below and we'll do some more math in the next video.